Well, good evening. Um, this is going to be a little different from my normal moment of clarity. I'm in the home of Miss Jacqueline Schwab, who is, uh, by all accounts, Ken Burns' house piano player in many movies from Civil War to baseball, uh, First World War. She's been his keyboardist for years. Uh, and I had a golden opportunity to spend an evening with her, and I will interview her from off camera. So Jacqueline, earlier this evening you were telling me about your first time playing for Ken Burns. And you just hit on a very important subject to me, that of operating in a flow condition. And it kind of sounded like you were in one of those, uh, in your element, playing for Mr. Burns. Could you recount some of that for us? Well, when I went to record for Ken Burns uh, in Brattleboro, Vermont, in a little studio that was in the basement of a bill of a rug dealer, <laughs> but a wonderful studio, um, I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't even own a TV at the time, so I didn't quite realize maybe how important it was <laughs> going to be. This is for what turned into his really epic a film, The Civil War, which just had its 25th year of airing all over the world and was just re-edited. Um, but so I didn't know what to expect. I think as I, uh, we were talking about, you asked why, maybe how did he connect with me in the first place? And it was through a recording I had played on with my English country dance quartet. English country dancing is something below the radar in the U.S., but uh, we, we've been playing together for decades and for, for very um, enthusiastic dancers all across the United States. And um, our first recording had that catchy title, English Country Dances. And somehow <laughs> Ken bought it. He said he bought it in a store, uh, which is possible because we were distributed. And so that may have happened uh, that way. Uh, but I think what drew, drew his attention to my playing, and he was looking for a pianist at the time, was uh, that we play with theme and variation. So we play this short theme, the country dance tune, and then when if you play it for a dance, you play it, play it again and again and again and again, maybe anywhere between three and 15 times. And our band um, would improvise variations on the theme, each of us taking the melody. And we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't set it very thoroughly before we recorded. We just decided who would take the melody each round. And then we had what we called the passion graph of when the piece was going to arc up. And of course, it didn't even always follow that. But that gave us a way to go, and that's how our band operated. And I think that's what Ken was looking for, was very simple, expressive playing from somebody who could um, vary a theme in many ways to tell a story. And that's really what he was looking for. He unusually, especially at the time that his film came, first came out, unusually used period music for the most part, not, not completely but uh, he would have a theme for each person or event. I can't remember the specifics, but, um, and so we might have to play a piece to make it sound like a party and then play it again as if it were after the devastation of a battle where a soldier is limping home and doesn't know if his sweetheart's alive and his house still there. You can think of Gone with the wind at the end when and what happened to Tara and and of course a lot of the South um, a lot of Georgia was burned and memorialized in this tune called Marching Through Georgia and that's always been played as a kind of thumper you know the 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 Union beating their breasts and saying we really did something great we won the war and we burned down Georgia and of and of course, if you're from Georgia, you might not think, agree with that sentiment. I once had a hostess from Georgia. I was playing in Maryland, but when she heard I was going to play Marching Through Georgia, she said to me, not really joking, 
And this is a liberal, mind you, at a, at a college presentation that's saying, I wasn't sure I was going to let you stay in my house if you were going to play Marching Through Georgia. But then when she heard me play it, as I did on the Ken Burns Civil War as a lament, she decided I was OK <laughs> and I could stay there. Um, it's, it, it's such a, an emotional topic, and Ken got deeply into the emotion of it. And so his storytelling, I know, and I've been going on and on here, but his storytelling swept me away. And so his way of making a film isn't the usual way of, uh, they call it locking a film, where the film's pretty much done, and then the music gets fit to the film. And I've worked on projects for other people that way, um, even including two MasterCard commercials. Um, but uh, with Ken for the Civil War, because he was using stills, he could um, start with the music and then fit his scenes around the music to some extent. It's still sort of a Procrustean theme thing. It had to fit certain amounts of time and there are places where the music did get chopped up but they they did honor it as much as they could and honored it beautifully but it was really Ken's charismatic storytelling and his passion for the topic and for the depth of sadness um, both that the war had to happen and both for slavery, but also the sadness in identifying with all the parties in the, in the, in the war. And he could, so, so we could change on a dime, change to a union celebration or a, or a Confederate celebration or a Confederate um, recruiting song or something after a battle and zing, zing, zing in, in, the, in the recording session, but he would tell me stories. And so, even though he was clearly a powerful person, I, I felt very collaborative with him. He's very uh, full of positive energy. And he just got me on his wavelength, and he got me playing pieces in a way I had never dreamed of playing them, slowing them down, speeding them up. Um, playing with one finger at a time, no, only melody. I, some, I call it liken that sometimes to making an omelet with just eggs. Uh, just, you know, no tricks, no extra chords, no ornamental notes, just, just the melody. And within that, I had to express these emotions that he was expressing to me in terms of telling the stories. I wasn't looking at film footage, just hearing him talk. So you didn't see the visual product while you were laying down the, the audio track at all. Correct. You just told the story and, and give me some music and I'll make the video fit. Yeah, yeah, oh, in a amazing. way. And, and, and he could do that again because he was working mostly with stills, but it was also just um, his artistic decision. And I think it did result in my letting go of my boundaries of uh, my perfectionism and, um, and the fact that we, and he also recorded, I think we had two different recording sessions and they were each one day or two days for this many day series. So whereas when I made this, the aforesaid MasterCard commercial, um, where they didn't pay me as much as I owe them, <laughs> but there it is. But, um, uh, <laughs> but um, we, uh, that was 30 seconds and I probably spent four hours crafting those 30 seconds. Right. And looking at the film and hearing, hearing uh, the the voices and trying to match my playing exactly with the voices and that was really fun too. I love working with words and music in lots of ways. But but working on the Civil War project for Ken, because of the way he was working and because of his deep commitment to the story, he he had just been living this for 
many, many years, and he was, he was uh, embedded in the story in his heart and his mind. He probably dreamed it. And so he transmitted it in his charismatic storytelling, and, and that spoke to me. And also his gentle manner with me and very accepting. And um, he, there's another studio person I love to work with who reminds me of the same attitude. But usually when you get to the recording studio, or at least when I do, the first take is not really something you want to save. And, and it's easy to start getting into a blaming mode then. But Ken and this other person that I'm thinking of who is a recording engineer in the DC area, she is like this too. You do the first take and they say, hmm, you know, in sort of like just a encouraging way, you know, not a suspicious way, but just, hmm. And then you do the second take and you're starting to warm up and they say, yeah. And then you do the third take and there you've got it. And they say, yes, you know, but there's never been a no or, and other people that I've worked with that can close me who, yeah. who, who, even if they don't say the no, you can see it in their serious manner and the face and they're not saying anything. And you start to think that you have, <laughs> you're really terrible. And, um, and that's when I have Mrs. Hoodoo make her appearance. <laughs> Who do you think you are? And, and, and then everything goes downhill from there. But in this process with Ken and other, some other people that are like this, it's, uh, ex I call it an expansive process. Even though he had boxed me in in lots of ways, you know, playing with just one finger at a time, no ornaments, and I was playing folk music where you do tend to ornament it and there's folk ornaments and he didn't want those ornaments. He wanted it very spare. Um, sometimes I was allowed to play a bass or a, a few chords here and there, but um, so I was being boxed in, but the atmosphere was so expansive that it, the box suddenly seemed really uh, large and um, I just entered into the story I, and I, I probably didn't do it perfectly each time and 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 I have lots of tendencies to not be that way but it's a goal in my life to be that way and of course after after working with somebody like that it's a it's kind of addictive and you will you want to have that experience again and then, the, of course, the next step is to see if you can create it yourself, not have to. I, I think if Ken acted kind of like a prospero or a sorcerer, you know, just bringing some hidden spirit out of me. Um, and, of course, now, since then, try to see how I can do that for myself or when I'm teaching students, how I can do it for them or when I'm performing a concert how I can be there, um, be with, we were talking about being with the story and that seems to do it for me. It's not a guarantee, um, but it's a good shot <laughs> that so it will after, do it. After Civil War, what was your next connection with Burns? Uh, you know, I'm not, I did say a moment earlier this evening that it was, um, a piece on the history of radio, and I think that might have been it, Empire of the Air. And somewhere in there, I did a few things for his film, The West, but Ken wasn't in the studio with me at that for that one. Um, and then Baseball, and then maybe Thomas Jefferson, and after that, I lost track. I know there were at least a dozen, um, mostly ones dealing with the 18th and 19th centuries. But um, a little bit, I got to do one, again, with Ken not in the studio with me, uh, but it was still a fun film on uh, called Horatio's Drive, about the first auto race across the U.S. And it was a, a, a very un-Ken-like film. I mean, most, most of Ken's films uh, 
have as at least an underlying secondary or maybe the primary theme underneath the stated topic, but that underprivileged people uh, g gaining, given given the right and the power to 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 be to share with equality and. Um, but Horatio's drive was really, um, well, it probably had some of, a lot of under themes too that I, but it also had a lot of humor in it and uh, lightheartedness. And um, even though the person racing across the US had all kinds of problems with his Winton car, <laughs> anyway, but it was really fun. All we people who race across the country have <laughs> problems with our cars. <laughs> And I've actually know a guy who raced in a Winton in a Great American Race. So what? This is like 1903, am I remembering? 1907. It's a very a long time. Yes. Yeah. Turn of the century. Wow. Certainly. Certainly. Wow. Well, you're, you're, here we are in Cape Cod, and the, there's a museum in Sandwich that has a the Heritage Museum has a whole display of Wintons. I should have sent you there when you were there. I'm sorry. I well, didn't. we'll come back and do this Anyway, again. you'll have to just come back anyway. So if, if you were going to leave your students with a lesson to be learned from the excitement and the joy you got out of working with Ken and to describe it to them and what to pursue, what would that sound like? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Well, Ken and his and Ken actually worked with his brother Rick Burns on the Civil War. He's not given the credit in some ways, uh, and their paths parted. Their their um, I don't think their personal paths parted, but their um, professional paths parted. And, and I've actually done some work for Rick also, but he's a very different method of working films. But that Ken and Rick had this belief about this this topic and they it wasn't really hot the 19th century was not hot when i was growing up it was so not hot i think we're starting to come back to it now and so they lucked into coming into it at a good time but basically they just believed in the importance of their project and so believing in what you do and believing in the in and I, importance isn't quite the right word. It's just that yeah. well, there may be the personal importance that it's important to get this the story out. That the story needs to be heard, and so I mean they had they had to get so much funding and and work on it for such a long time and probably had hardships in their financial lives while they were working on it. Um, uh, so that's one. And another is just, um, so believing in your project. And I think that helped me lead to believing in the playing, that I didn't have to worry about whether I was right or wrong for the project, Oh no, I, I'm not a I'm not a person who plays slow laments. I wasn't when I played for him. Uh, I am now at my concerts, but uh, but just just trusting that I was there for a reason. They picked me, and um, and that it's possible to jump onto a a train and jump onto a train and just be on that train and. Follow, follow it, and even if it takes you out of, as a pianist, as a dance musician, which is what I was before I worked for Ken, it took me out of my um, neurological pattern. You know, there, there are practice patterns that are in there, but somehow that by believing a story that um, I could be free and even though I was in a box and and that and that and that can take you somewhere and to trust my heart in it and I it was I felt very naked when I played for him 
partly because I was in that box. So I was playing music in a way I hadn't played it before and in, in very bare and very exposed. But my job was to tell the story and to enter into it. And that's something I found in myself. So I guess to say that we don't all know what's in ourselves. We don't know who we are necessarily. You know, we, I think we maybe tend to know our strengths. I, I, I have known my artistic strengths, but I've, there's more in there that you can be uh, than you think is there. It, it, I was lucky that somebody jump-started it for me. So the lesson is, though, can we do that for ourselves? And of course, we're connected, so it, it is great to collaborate with somebody, but it, it, just that the possibility is, is there. Um, Did you find a certain freedom in uh, founding a genre of music, a la Ken Burns' keyboard? <laughs> Because you have, there's no one who can compare against you. You're not judged by anybody else based on that. It's not like going to a Tchaikovsky competition where everybody knows every note you missed and didn't do on time. It's all yours and Ken's. I, 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 well, I have to give credit to the huge traditional music community in the United States. So, yes, I do have a unique voice. And people listening to me on the Burns thing, who'd had no idea that I had any connection with it, had said, oh, what's Jacqueline doing playing on the, yeah, I, that's her, even though they hadn't heard me playing that kind of music in that way. But, so I do have a unique voice, but it's on the shoulders of many great musicians, um, dance musicians, and I've been at so many folk gatherings where I've heard singers and instrumentalists and and I've internalized those voices and also that I studied at New England Conservatory of Music in a really special program for improvisers it was then called Third Stream and they really encouraged us to meld streams of music and to make it our own and they worked on our ear training so my playing is on the backs of many people. And yet I would say I think I do have a unique voice, or at least now, I mean, I hear people kind of inspired by what I've played. And so that's, I mean, that's thrilling. And of course, then you think, well, I'd like to have those jobs too. So, Everybody you know, you. <laughs> but, um, uh, but I, I, I don't think it's really made me famous, but it's gotten my voice to, into the world. And that's very satisfying. Well, there's this interview to make you famous. We <laughs> there we that. go. There we go. We um, uh, it's, um, I do really, well, I'm a child of the 60s, and I'm shy and introverted, I think, and not all those things, and I can stand in front of an audience and share my passion for the music, but um, I, I do, would not have fared as well in, in a field where you're, where you're, where you're line up and have to compete. I, it doesn't bring out the best in me. I mean, it does in many people, but not, not for me. So I was immensely lucky that I got this opportunity where I wasn't, I didn't have to audition for it. I, I just was there and here you are and, and play. And um, I, I have tried a few auditions in my life and, and usually gone frozen. But I, but I think I, if I can live long enough, I, I do have hopes of, I mean, the, the whole experience of that has led to quite a lot of journeys for me, some of them in the public arena, you know, professional and playing concerts, and, but many of them really in my spirit. I've had muscle problems a, 
up a year or two after the Burns thing came out and had to stop playing for a while and really learn anew how to play the piano. And um, so it's led me to a whole inner journey. Um, and I think the spirit of what Ken gave me is 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 one of the you know angels or guides or mantras or just good model you know for whatever your belief system is you know whatever it is but it's it was a good a good start for me not just because it got my music into the public arena but because it gave me permission to be myself, I guess as I was saying earlier, although now I play ragtime and I've had the honor to play on the stage with some really great ragtime players and I know I'm not one of them, but I do play ragtime in concerts, but I am primarily a lyrical pianist, but wow, I'm playing ragtime now. And again, that came through Ken Burns, his Mark Twain movie assigning me to play Maple Leaf Rag. and. It probably wasn't the most exciting version of Maple Leaf Rag that ever happened, but it got me started playing ragtime. And and again, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be having a, getting a wider view of myself. And again, I, I just think of, so again, I think my word, the word that comes to me after all these words I've just given you, for, for my work with Ken was that it was expansive for me. And, and really, less or so that it made my name or, I mean, many people really loved the music from the Civil War, but that did not translate to me in terms of getting a concert audience yet. <laughs> But there's still time if yes, I can live long. If I still live long enough. Another 25 but, <laughs> and I think maybe people associate me with the spare playing and don't know that there's other things that I do. I'm at my newest recording, True Blue Waltz, has a Latin waltz on it and a bluesy waltz, and it's and I'm going to town with new styles and and and. And yet, it's still me, and finding how that that's that voice that I have that speaks, sort of even hard to say what it is, but and and, and I guess the same thing with Ken's voice. What it was it? What is it? And we all are riding on other people's backs, but yet singing our song to the world. I guess so. That's what it gave me the confidence to go out and try to do, even though it didn't give me instant fame or fortune. Well, Jacqueline, we first met five years ago when you played at the History Museum in St. Louis. And I'm hoping that when we get you back to St. Louis, we can take you to the home of Scott Joplin. Oh, sign me up. Maple Ray. Um, uh, this has been Jacqueline Schwab. Uh, I'm just delighted to be in her home uh, on the eastern coast of the United States where I never get. And we just hooked up and you benefit from this hookup. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Oh, thanks so much, Kim. Great talking with you.